Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. This is a radical gospel statement from our John 15 gospel reading this morning. A statement that ought to bring us immense comfort and joy. Let me say it again. You did not choose me. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Think about that for a moment. That means that God chose you. Yes, You, all of you, all of the parts of you that you would like no one else to know about, God knows, and yet still Jesus speaks this to his disciples. It doesn't take long a long time reading in the New Testament to figure out his disciples are certainly not perfect people. And yet God says to them and says to you, you did not choose me, but I chose you. This is a statement of immense comfort, and it often brings us comfort. Yet, we also easily disbelieve this reality because the love behind what God is saying to each of us here, it's hard to fathom. He doesn't attach any condition or, you know, agreement between you and him. He just says it. And if you know anything about Reformation history, this was the big revelation from the scriptures for Martin Luther. He spent most of his life as a Catholic monk and priest, always concerned that God was this angry judge because all he could think about was how he couldn't stop sinning in thought, word, and deed. And the reality, the blessed reality that freed him from his fear of God's judgment was this reality of the love of God in Christ Jesus. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And this is the reality that he clung to, that he preached and taught about, and this is the reality that we cling to. Because like Luther and like the disciples, it's not like you're pretending when you do your confession some weeks. It's always genuine. We are always struggling in our sin. And yet, despite knowing all of that about you, God says to you in Jesus, I chose you. In other words, your salvation is not your own doing. It has nothing to do with you or me. It is God's work. He's the subject of this sentence. He's the one who's doing the action I chose you. Now, you may have heard phrases among Christian communities such as this. I'm giving my heart to Christ. Or, I have chosen to make Christ the Lord of my life. Or, I have chosen to give my life to Christ. Or maybe you've even said some of those things yourselves. But we confess that this is not what the Scriptures teach And this is one of those verses we reference because God is clearly saying in John 15, we aren't the ones who do the deciding, we aren't the ones who do the choosing. He chooses us. Now, before you jump to being too judgmental about that, many people say those things because they don't know how to express in words what God has done for them in Jesus. But the danger still remains, and this is the reason why this isn't simply splitting hairs. Those statements taken at face value actually teach people the opposite of what Jesus is telling his disciples here. Those statements say, I, me, the disciple, chose you, God. And that's an extremely dangerous place to begin your faith. Because then your faith is no longer in God and what he's doing in Jesus, but it is in your faith. You have faith in faith itself. 
And that's dangerous because then what happens when your faith isn't as strong as it should be? Or when you stumble and fall and are in need of forgiveness and mercy as we continually are? If my faith is in my faithfulness, I'm left hopeless. But if my faith is in the fact that God knew all that stuff about me and in Jesus still says to me, I chose you, then I'm not despairing. I come before his altar. I come before his throne and in confidence confess my sin because I know what he has done for me in Jesus is forgive me of those sins. Now, you may be wondering at this point, but wait, what's all that stuff in the John 15 reading that talks about obeying commandments and doing what God has commanded and bearing fruit? Doesn't that mean we are supposed to do something? Yes, but maybe not quite in the way that we typically think of it. See, in the church, there are two main aspects of the Christian life two teachings. One is called the teachings on justification, and the other one is on sanctification. Those are big words, but justification we use a lot of, in, a lot in our regular language. It's what we use to justify ourselves, the same kind of idea, right? When you come home and you know your parents know that you did something you weren't supposed to, you start coming up with excuses or reasons why the thing happened that happened that shouldn't have happened. And what are you doing when you do that? You're trying to justify yourself in the eyes of your parents. You're trying to make right that relationship with them. Well, we are called to do that with God as well. Yet, we have nothing to say. What's our excuse before God? In what way can we justify ourselves before the person, the God who gave us everything in perfection, and then we ruined it? So the church teaches that when it comes to justification, that's the statement where God says, I chose you. We cannot do anything to justify ourselves. We have no righteousness of our own before God, only that which is given to us in Jesus. But in sanctification, that's a different story. See, in sancti- the sanctified living of the Christian is now that you have become a new creation in Jesus, now that you have been made into a child of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus, through the waters of holy baptism as we heard in our, um, our Acts reading today. Now that that has occurred, we can actually do the things that God asks us to do. Not perfectly, but we can do them where before we were totally incapable. So we get to this phrase in our John 15 reading where Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And then he says, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. The choosing he's speaking of here, Jesus speaking to his disciples in the upper room is what's thought to be in this text. The choosing that he speaks to his disciples is the exact same choosing that he has done for you. All Christians are chosen by God, not the other way around. As Lutherans, we believe that's through sharing the means of grace, through sharing God's Word. The Holy Spirit works faith in the hearts of those who don't yet believe. In other words, it is a work of God. But then he goes on and says, and appointed you. The Greek verb there also means to establish or to set or to place. And we teach in our church that that refers to what we would call the doctrine of vocation. That each of us is called, God has called us, appointed to us to a certain thing in a certain place. And that's where the difference comes in. He's talking to his disciples right now. They had a very different appointment than you and me, right? What was Paul's appointment as an apostle? He was set in place to minister the gospel to the Gentiles. Mike, one of my vocations is to be a pastor. One of your vocations might be to be a doctor or a lawyer or a manager, a father, a mother, a grandmother, a son, a daughter, a brother, or sister. And each one of those things 
comes with it a set of responsibilities from God, things that He's commanded us to do. The best example is the number four on the Big Ten list. Honor your father and your mother, a direct command from God within a specific vocation. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And in those vocations, having become children of God, having been appointed by Him in those particular places, we now do what He commands. We now bear fruit and fruit that abides. So then the only question left to ask is, well, what is the fruit? What is the fruit, the good works that are meant to abide? Now, what do we think of when we think of good works? What, what comes into your mind when you think of good works? They're usually grand gestures, mission trips where you're helping the deeply impoverished, lifelong pursuits of justice, the giving up of your life in pursuit of some lauded goal. Maybe you're a missionary in a foreign country. Maybe you make a deep abiding sacrifice for a family member or friend. Or maybe you just think of being kind to others or donating money to a good cause. The list goes on and on. But really the question we should be asking ourselves here is not what we think of when we think of good works, but what does God mean, what does Jesus mean when he talks about good fruit? Well, I like the image of good fruit because it helps us understand the relationship between our good works and our own will. What bears good fruit, a dead tree or a healthy one? And how does a dead tree become healthy? There are all these images in the Old Testament that those who are in the Word, those who are near God, are like a tree that's planted by streams of living water. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that stream of living water is the action of God in Jesus. You who were once a dead tree bearing no fruit, have been made alive in Jesus. And now, enabled by the gift of His Holy Spirit, you are a tree that bears good fruit. And this good fruit is obeying the commands that God has given. In verse 10 of our Gospel reading, He says, If you keep My commandments, you will abide in My love, just as I have kept My Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now, we can't keep the Father's commandments like Jesus did perfectly. But through the gift of the gospel, through His death and resurrection, He has given that perfection to each of us. He's given that fulfillment of the law to each of us when He took His sin upon Himself on the cross. And so now we are able to bear that good fruit. And He boils down what that fruit is at the very end of our reading in this simple verse. These things I command you, the stuff of sanctification, the, the now being made a new creation, the way you live, these things I command you so that you will love one another. That's the goal. But this is such a beautiful text because it helps us keep those things separate. We are so tempted to disbelieve the statement from God in Jesus, I chose you. Whether it's a sense of guilt and we want to feel like we have to do something to earn His love. It can't be that easy, right? Or whether it's a desire to do good that the devil or our own sinful flesh twists into something that we take pride in and begin to place our hope and trust in. This text reminds us that those are two separate things. That your justification is the work of God alone and He has completed it. That's what we celebrate in the season of Easter. God's plan of salvation fulfilled. Your redemption fully paid for. And the life of sanctification we are now called to. That's the battle we face day in and day out, week in and week out. Why we come back to receive the Word of God and the gifts of God. Why we come back week in and week out in confession of our sins. Is to do this very thing. To bear fruit and fruit that abides. So that we may love one another. 
So, dear friends in Christ, be comforted by the knowledge of the gospel that you, in fact, are a child of God solely by the work of God in Jesus and that He has called you, He chose you, and appointed you so that your life can reflect His glory, so that others may know this glorious truth that God chooses them in Jesus as well. God be with us as we endeavor to proclaim this glorious news to others. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again to make all things new. Amen. Please rise.